everyone and welcome to the latest A Spotlight On interview. Today I'm joined by Jeffrey Moffat, um, who's going to tell us all about spatial biology. So without further ado, Jeff, could you introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do? Certainly. So first of all, thank you, Lauren, for taking the time to chat with me today. And thank you, everybody who's joining, I guess, virtually uh, for this conversation. So my name is Jeff Moffat, as, as Lauren mentioned, and I'm an assistant professor at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, my lab started in 2018, so we're a young lab still. I got my PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, where I did biophysics work with Carlos Bustamante. And then I was trained uh, as, as a postdoc um, uh, with Xiaowei Shuang in the chemistry department at Harvard. And it was in Xiaowei's lab that I helped co-develop a technology that we call multiplexed air robust fluorescence in situ hybridization, or MRFISH for short. And that is an image-based approach to spatial transcriptomics. So in a nutshell, this is a technology that allows us to image and identify hundreds to thousands to 10,000 different RNA molecules with intact fixed samples. And that could be cell culture or slices of a wide variety of different tissues. And so this is a technology that my laboratory is leveraging heavily uh, in the variety of things that we are uh, now starting to tackle. That's great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what actually is spatial biology and what's its role within omics? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So in many ways, I mean, spatial biology as a term captures many things, but perhaps one way to think about this is, is the merger of the spatial component that has a biology that's typically been um, reserved for technologies like microscopy. So techniques that allow us to image where different cells are found within a tissue and the organization of those tissues and the organization of molecules within those tissues or samples. And it's the merger of that suite of technologies with genomics. So things that we think of that allow us to probe the complexity of the gene products produced by samples. So technologies like RNA sequencing or in the past decade or so now single cell RNA sequencing. And so I think everyone uh, who's tuning into this is probably quite familiar with the tremendous amount of biological insight that those type of omics scale measures have been able to provide into biology. And so what's exciting about this new suite of technologies that are captured in this term spatial biology is that they can maintain the strengths that we have seen, the discovery potential that we've seen from single cell and uh, genomic scale measures, and couple that with the tremendous insight that has been provided historically via microscopy and technologies there, which give you the intricate organization of molecules within cells and cells within tissues, but historically have been limited in the number of molecules that they can probe in a single sample. The merger of these technologies now allows us to make microscopy style measurements, but with genomic scale information. Right, okay. And so why is it um, so important to not just understand cell type, um, but also the spatial and functional organization of cells within a tissue? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. And I think this is one of the things that drives the excitement in this field. I mean, there's many answers to that, but if you permit me, I'll give you a, an analogy. So um, when I was young, I, I used to do a lot of auto mechanics with my father. And so imagine that you wanted to understand how a car engine works, a complex machine comprised of many different parts. And so having a catalog of all the parts that fit within that engine, pistons, spark plugs, et cetera, and understanding their individual function, that provides tremendous insight into how an engine functions. But it's really only part of the picture. If you were given that catalog of parts, but no understanding how they assemble and fit together, I think you can get a sense of the challenge you would have at understanding how the engine actually works. And so in, in many ways, that analogy applies really to biology, where technologies like single cell RNA sequencing and single nucleus sequencing have done a phenomenal job of giving us parts catalogs. We know what the cell types and states are within these samples. But until we understand how they are assembled physically and spatially together, we really can struggle to understand how the behavior and function of individual cells cooperatively gives rise to the function of the tissue as a whole. And so it's that ability to both discover these parts and put them together, which I think is really the discovery potential and promise of these spatial biology tools. 
Yeah, that's a great analogy. I've never heard that before, but <laughs> that's really useful. Um, so could you tell us about some of your work um, to build cellular atlases of complex tissues um, and a bit about how you use single cell transcriptomics to do this? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I can give you a little bit of an overview of the type of things that we're doing in my lab and the work that I did um, while a postdoc in, in Xiaowei Shuang's laboratory. Um, so, for example, one, uh, I think, very illustrative example of the potential of cellular atlasing with MRFish and spatial transcriptomics in general comes out of the work that I did as a postdoc, where in collaboration with Catherine Dulac's laboratory, we took a region of the mouse brain known as the preoptic area or preoptic region in the hypothalamus. And we used MRFish, this image-based approach that allows us to image and identify single RNA molecules within samples, to profile about 150 different RNAs simultaneously within individual cells. And by selecting those RNAs so that they uh, contain classically defined markers of different cell types, as well as panels of genes that are functionally relevant to the way in which neurons in this region of the brain can communicate, we could basically define all of the cell types that one would anticipate to find in this region of the brain, as well as define a really truly remarkable diversity of neuronal types in this small region of the brain. And because we were imaging everything within intact slices, we basically for free got an atlas of this tissue. We knew exactly where each of these cell types was found, what they were next to. Uh, and importantly for the hypothalamus, there had been a tremendous amount of work previously to define different anatomical regions within the hypothalamus and functions for the neurons within those. And so we could go now and, and define molecularly and cellularly the diversity of neurons that comprise these different regions. And then because RNA expression itself can report on cellular state, we could actually start to begin, uh, we could start to functionally annotate the different types of cells that we would find in this region. So for example, we could stimulate these mice um, with a variety of cues that trigger instinctive behaviors that are known to be controlled in part by circuits in that region of the brain. And then we could look for RNAs that are expressed in neurons that have recently fired. Those are what are known as immediate early genes. And so by looking at what neurons were expressing those genes, which were proxies for neuronal activity, we could determine which neurons were involved in the circuits that control the instinctive responses to behavior. So it's, it, this allowed us to basically define the parts, the cell types, to define their organization within the tissue and also to begin to define their functional role in the different, you know, the different instinctive behaviors that are controlled by regions of this, this part of the brain. And we're now doing the same type of thing in a wide variety of tissues uh, in my laboratory. And so we're collaborating very broadly um, in tissues ranging from the mouse brain, the, the other portions of the mouse uh, nervous system. We have collaborations in uh, human tissues, lymph nodes, and, and lymphatic tissues. We have uh, a variety of collaborations in other human tissues as well. My lab itself is focused mainly on looking at aspects of the interface between microbial communities and the host. And, and one of our um, major focuses is in the gut microbiome and how spatial structure in microbial communities and spatial structure on the host can shape interactions across this interface, both in homeostasis and health but also when problems arise and uh, disease is the result. So um, most of that work is still unpublished, but we are very excited to use this type of technology and extend it in ways that allow us to do similar things to what I described in the mouse brain in both the mouse and the human gut. Yeah, it's a really exciting area. I'm gonna ask you a little bit about that um, a bit later as well, um, but could you, you've kind of touched on it there, but. You mentioned MRFish, so this technique that you co-developed. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit more about how that actually works? Yeah, absolutely. So MRFish at its core is based upon a very powerful technique that had been developed many, many er years earlier. Um, it's a technology known as single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization, or single molecule fish, or sometimes called SM fish. And so this is a technology in which you take and create fluorescently labeled DNA oligonucleotides that are complementary in sequence to regions of the RNA that you want to target. If you create a large number of these, each targeting a different region of that RNA, you can then take a sample, you can fix it, poke holes in the membrane or permeabilize it, 
and then hybridize on these probes. And then base pairing of those probes to the complementary region on the RNA will actually bind a fluorophore to that RNA. And by having many probes, you can concentrate many probes at each and every molecular copy of that RNA. So now if you image that sample with an epifluorescence or a confocal microscope, you'll see a bright fluorescent spot. And that spot is the signal generated by a single RNA molecule. And so now you can actually do spatial transcriptomics. You can count how many spots you see within a cell. That tells you how many copies of that RNA. And you can see where that cell is within the context of the whole because you're, of course, imaging the sample. And so that very powerful technique has been used to great effect to answer a wide variety of questions. But historically, it's been limited in its multiplexing because if you want to target multiple RNAs, the standard approach has been to use multiple colors. And each RNA gets a different color. And there's only so many colors you can see in a microscope. And so the key insight that we developed in MRFISH was that we were going to replace the colors that we discriminate individual RNAs with, with barcodes. And now every different RNA gets its own barcode. And then we have a process by which we can read out those barcodes optically. So individual molecules still generate a fluorescent spot that tells us where they are. But this optical barcode, if you will, is what tells us the identity of that RNA. And you can think about these barcodes in many different ways. But the simplest way, I think, is to consider them as a binary barcode. One RNA is given 1, 1, 0. Another one is given 1, 0, 1. And then another 0, 1, 1. And the power of binary barcodes, of course, is that every time you add one more bit, you could effectively double the number of RNAs that you could discriminate. And so the number of barcodes and the number of RNAs that you could distinguish, it just explodes as the number of bits increases. And so the insight that we had with MRFISH is that instead of doing one round of staining and imaging with single molecule fish, we could do many rounds. And in its simplest form, you could think about one round of single molecule fish represents a single bit. If an RNA is fluorescent in that round, it gets a one. If it's not, it gets a zero. And so your first image tells you the value of the binary uh, entry in the first bit. Then you then remove that signal, restain the sample, and now you can, again, use fluorescence on-off signals to tell you the value of the second bit. So the fluorescence on-off pattern uh, developed across a series of single molecule fish images is the physical embodiment of this binary barcode. It's, it's the optical barcode. And so there are many details of how we actually implement that are critical to how this scales. The first important aspect of it is that adding one more round of single molecule fish adds a bit, doubles the number of barcodes. But the problem with this type of combinatorial labeling approach is it's very sensitive to error. So if you, if you don't have a molecule that's bright enough to be called a molecule when it should, then you think about that as misreading a one as a zero. And those type of error, errors, while infrequent, compound very quickly. And so we recognized right in the implementation of MRFISH is that we had to have a way to handle those errors. And by conceptualizing these barcodes as binary barcodes, we could basically borrow from decades of understanding of how you handle noise and binary communication. And, and so what we use are slightly modified forms of error robust and correcting encoding schemes. These are schemes first developed in the context of information theory and used extensively in computer science that actually can allow you to identify when a bit has been corrupted and in certain circumstances actually uncorrupt and correct that bit. And so we leverage those type of barcodes to actually encode our RNA identity. And that gives us very high performance in this technology. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it's amazing how you like adapted that to Murfish. Um, so this is a bit more of a broader overview, but what are some of the advantages of being able to directly image genome-wide properties um, of individual cells within tissues? Yeah, so I mean, I think there are a variety of advantages, and, and perhaps that also depends on contrasting with other methods for spatial uh, biology. There, as you, as you are, I'm sure, very well aware, there's now a very, it's an exciting time in the field because there's a growing array of approaches to gain genomic scale information while registering that information in space. And so, you know, there's a suite of technologies that allow you to do that in a spatially resolved capture approach. So you can essentially capture molecules on a surface that has been barcoded in a certain way, spatially barcoded, I should say. And then those barcodes tell you where those molecules come from. Those are very powerful techniques. They've been providing great biological insight, but they've been historically limited in their resolution. So the advantage of what we're doing in which we generate fluorescent signals directly from individual RNAs, one advantage, I should say, 
is that um, we are able to leverage the highest optical resolution possible. So we can resolve the location of these RNAs to the you know, 100 nanometer scale or better, subcellular scale. So that means that not only can you unambiguously assign RNAs within individual cells and get true single cell expression profiles, you can actually understand the structure of those RNAs within cells. And there's a, a whole host of post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms that are driven by the internal location of RNAs within a cell. And there are diseases that are cued by mislocalization, not just misexpression. So this ability to resolve RNAs at that length scale is very powerful because it opens up a wide variety of biological questions that aren't possible with spatial biology techniques that have a more modest resolution. The other advantage, of course, is that you can tile many images together so that it's you have this 100 nanometer or better scale resolution, but you can have that across centimeter squared areas or tissue areas. And so you can span a really remarkable dynamic range in length from nanometer to centimeter. And that's critical because the biology of tissues often covers that length scale where you have critical interactions that happen between individual cells and even in individual molecular interactions between those cells. But of course, those occur in the context of cellular neighborhoods and in tissue architectures. And so having ability to span that length scale in a single measurement or that range of length scales, it's actually important for understanding the biology of many uh, uh, tissue level questions. Another advantage that's perhaps less well appreciated is because you're generating signals from the molecules within the sample themselves, you can have a very high capture efficiency. And, and what that means is if you had say 100 copies of a molecule in that sample, the capture efficiency or the detection efficiency would be a measure of how many of those you actually detect. If you detected 90 out of those 100, you'd have a 90% detection or capture efficiency. And for methods that remove the molecules from the sample in order to characterize them and their spatial location um, um, post hoc through sequencing, like these spatial capture methods, historically have had much more modest capture efficiencies. But with MRFISH, because you're imaging these molecules and generating the signals within the sample without ever removing the RNAs, without ever having to convert the RNAs to another type of molecule like DNA, these capture efficiencies can be very high, almost 100%. That's important because there are whole swaths of RNAs that are very important for key aspects of biology, and yet they're expressed at a couple copies per cell when they're actually expressed in those cells. Those can include transcription factors, or receptors, or other categories. And those have been historically challenging categories of genes to analyze with technologies that have more modest capture efficiencies. So this ability to actually get very, very high detection or capture efficiencies opens up aspects of biology with MRFISH that, that is challenging to do with other techniques. Yeah, it's really incredible to hear about the advantages there. Um, so as well, what is the value in enabling um, sort of simultaneous imaging of the transcriptome and the proteome? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, uh, you know, just a little bit of background here. Um, you know, MRFISH is an RNA imaging technology, but uh, we have been able to couple this with proteomic imaging. We do that by leveraging phenomenal advances in oligotagged antibodies. So you can tag an antibody with a DNA molecule. And now when you stain your sample, the act of reading out the location of the antibody is now just hybridizing on a fluorescently labeled oligo complementary to the tag that's on the antibody. So we've turned immunofluorescence problem into a hybridization problem. And now this exact same hybridization chemistry that's used to read out these optical barcodes associated with RNAs can be immediately leveraged to read out uh, proteins. You know, my lab and, and, and the work I've done before has been more focused on modest scale of multiplexing in proteomics. Um, but these oligo-labeled antibodies with other spatial biology techniques have been really pushed towards the scale of 50, maybe 100 different proteins. And the combination with MRFISH, I think, would be quite straightforward. The advantage of layering proteomics is perhaps multifold. So the first is that um, it's just a practical aspect. When you have a technology like single cell sequencing where you dissociate out the cells, capture single cells, extract their RNAs, you get the encapsulation of RNAs within a cell basically for free. You get it from the physical uh, uh, boundaries of the cell itself. But in image-based methods, you have a slice of tissue, you see the location of every RNA, 
but you don't necessarily know a priori how to partition those RNAs into individual cells. That's what's called the cell segmentation problem. Look at an imaging and define where the boundaries of each cell are located. Um, my lab has been working uh, extensively on this problem project. We have a collaboration with Peter Karchenko's lab that's been quite successful in developing algorithms to handle this. But one of the ways that proteomics is powerful is that you can include immunofluorescent stains against markers of cell boundaries, cell surface markers. And so you can use immunofluorescence to help define the boundaries of these cells to partition RNAs into. And that's a very powerful way in which these technologies can be combined. But that's kind of like a practical aspect that's at, at giving us the ability to overcome a technical challenge, not to layer on new biological insights. And there, I think there's a lot of promise for proteomics. For example, in, in, in work by others, there have been beautiful studies where you can include antibodies to different histone modifications. And so now you can actually report on aspects of the epigenetic state of that cell while also reading out the transcriptional state as well. One could imagine doing the same for phosphorylation state of signaling proteins or even localization state of transcription factors. And so by layering in proteomics, I think what we will see is the ability to add new biological dimensions that aren't as immediately read out by transcriptomic measures. And that I think is the promise of this combination. Though I think much of that is, is still to be realized. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating and it will be great to see how it sort of develops in the future, definitely. Um, I just want to go back to something you touched on. So you obviously mentioned that a lot of your research is around understanding host microbiome interactions. Um, I wondered from your perspective, why is this such an exciting area? And perhaps could you touch on some of the work you're doing in this area? Yeah, so what I'll say is that, you know, this is a new direction for, for me and my laboratory. It's a, it's a topic that I found fascinating for quite some time, and I'm, I'm excited to be able to dive into this area. Um, there are many reasons why I think it's interesting, but most of those are, are personal for me. I mean, they're, they're fascinating. It's a fascinating topic. Um, in, in, in some sense, I think we, we've seen over the past, you know, decade of beautiful sequencing work by a wide variety of groups that you know, microbial communities play uh, a, a very important role in the homeostasis of the organism with, within they reside. And they can play fundamental roles in almost all phenotypes, mammalian phenotypes, whether it's nutrient absorption and digestion and availability, whether it's education, the immune system, whether it's neurological state and the development of um, neurological disorders. And I think that, um, you know, we're really seeing this field move uh, from correlative studies into really mechanistic studies, understanding the actual bacterial communities or individual bacteria and the small molecules they make and the ways they interact with the host that drive this type of phenotypic uh, outcomes in the host. And, and for us, what we are hoping to be able to do is to provide an, an, a window into aspects of this interface that have been perhaps historically understudied because of challenges in the technology. And that's just the spatial organization of this. And so, you know, that can range from understanding how the, you know, what, what are the actual ecosystems at the micron scale in the gut? How does that shape microbial communities? And in turn, how does that shape the dynamics within these communities? To questions of what happens when um, this, this interaction between host and microbe uh, takes a turn for the worse and you have infection or uh, pathogenesis. And, and these are places where you can have you know, very local interactions that remodel both the microbiome and the host. And so you know, for us, being able to come into this field with a tool that allows us to look in space at the organization of this interface in, in both homeostasis and disease and to reveal the gene expression changes that happen in that context. I think it's very exciting because it offers a relatively new window into uh, this great system that, that many labs have really made phenomenal progress on understanding. Yeah, that's, I, yeah, I'm the same. I find it very interesting as well. Um, I think it's an incredibly interesting area. Um, so I guess you kind of touched on it there, but what are some of the goals of um, your research in this space now and like into the future? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, we're really just getting started in this space. So, um, 
you know, the spatial transcriptomics, uh, in particular MRFISH, need some extension in order to be able to ask questions across this interface. And so much of what my lab is working on now is, is extending this technology in those key ways. And this is actually very exciting for us. You know, throughout my career, I've had an opportunity to work in technology development where we are identifying biological questions that are just beyond our technical capabilities and then working to build the technologies that open the door for that. And there, that is just a very rewarding way to do science, in my opinion. And that's what we're trying to do here. And so I think by working at this interface, we are pushing ourselves to extend MRFISH and spatial transcriptomics uh, more broadly to allow us to ask these type of biological questions that have basically been very difficult to ask previously. So that's very rewarding to me. And I, I hope that it's also very rewarding for our students because it gives them an opportunity to learn all the skills associated with building and extending a cutting edge technology while also using it to do some very interesting biology. Yeah, definitely. Um, in a broader sense then, um, what are you excited about for the future of spatial biology or where do you see the field heading? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are multiple aspects that, uh, that are very exciting about this new type of measurement modality that we see with uh, spatial biology and in particular the image-based transcriptomic. Uh, techniques like MRFISH. The, you know, to take a very broad perspective, what I think is the most exciting to me is that is to see this technology that, you know, I played a role in the development of disseminate out there and be used broadly. That's very rewarding for someone who's worked to build new technologies, to see others make discoveries with that technology. And, and, and I think we're really starting to see this happen, not just for MRFISH, but for the, uh, the field of spatial biology as a whole. We're seeing these technologies move out of the labs that develop them and into the hands of others. And what I think is th there will be many aspects, many different aspects of uh, biology uh, in which this technology has an impact. But perhaps the most obvious one, in, in my opinion, is that it has the potential to really change our understanding or enrich our understanding of tissue level function and dysfunction. And what I mean by that is, again, returning to this analogy of the car engine. So it's not just that we wanna understand how this engine works because it's a beautiful piece of machinery, though that is of course one aspect of it. If you have an understanding of how it works, when something goes wrong and you're faced with a, you know, an odd clicking or some ugly smoke that comes out the tailpipe, you are extraordinarily well posed to create rationally designed diagnostics and interventions and treatments because you understand all the parts of the system and how they fit and function together. And that I think has been one of the challenges of, um, of, of modern medicine is, is really being able to stratify disease and to create rational interventions. And it's really amazing how, how much has been done if you just pose the, the, the point that we don't really still know the full set of cell types and states and their organization in basically any human tissue. And you know, again, there's a tremendous amount of work that's been done and these spatial transcriptomic techniques, I think offer us the ability to come in and really provide a more comprehensive view. Um, in many cases, probably really solidifying the beautiful work that's been done over decades in defining cell types and states in different tissues, but adding the potential to discover new or, or, or rare cell, cell type states or interactions, and to, to layer on that really a genomic view, you know, a comprehensive view of the molecules that are expressed within these cells. And I think what that type of cellular atlasing will do is it will give us a healthy reference that allows us to make much more rational diagnostic and uh, uh, prognostic and interventions when, when we have the diversity of diseases that arise from different tissues. And so I think these, these, these technologies have this ability to help us really change the way we, we approach human disease. That's a long way off. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get there, but I, 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 I find that to be a very exciting potential for these technologies. Yeah, it certainly is exciting. Um, 
So just to finish off here, um, you will actually be speaking at the Triomics Summit in September. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you're excited or why you're looking forward to that event? Yeah, so again, you know, I think that uh, I always love being able to get out and 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 talk with uh, you know a diverse set of scientists, and I think this event is likely to bring in people from many different aspects of biology and technology development. Um, there's a really great lineup of of speakers in the spatial biology space, and so I'm looking forward to not just being able to share our work and and uh, a deeper understanding of this technology with that community, but also to hear more about. Uh, what they're doing and how they're continuing to push this field as well. And so I, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a fun event uh, and an educational event. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. So that's actually all we've got time for today. Um, I've certainly learned a lot about spatial transcript transcriptomics um, and MERFISH in particular. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you again for taking the time to answer my questions. Um, it's been really great, great chatting with you. Thank you, Lord.